welcome. The show is in honor of Ahmed Salik. And with us, we have uh, our guest today is Raul Lopez and co-host uh, Paul Dietrich. And it's, it's our honor to bring this show to you. Before we get into the show, though, I, I want to bring up some. We started this show about seven years ago. Uh, it was Eddie Matusiak, John Byrne, and Frank Zielinski, and f- of course, Paul Dietrich, and myself. And the idea of the show was to bring veterans' stories, organizational stories, um, to the public. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Frank Zielinski passed uh, about a year ago. Eddie Matusiak passed. And most recently, John Byrne passed. And uh, it leaves Paul and I to, to bring you in honor of. But the, the point here is these were five gentlemen that got together and said, let's put the veteran story on television and continue. We've been doing it successfully for seven years. And for John Byrne, uh, God knows he was the you, oldest you'll of be us. missed. Huh? He was the oldest he of us. He was the oldest of us. Two. He was on the ship when they dropped the A-bomb. Yep. And, uh, he saw it. And uh, John, we pray that you're in heaven. We hope that you all get together and you're doing it in honor of up there. Okay. Now to, to the show. Raul, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving us a few moments. Then. Uh, your job is Army Veterans Services? Well, I work at West Point, and my responsibilities are uh, managing an Army program called Survivor Outreach Services. Right, that's it. Yep. Yeah. So the idea of the program is to provide long-term care and support to our Gold Star families who have lost a loved one on active duty. Doesn't matter what the cause was. Even though it's an Army program, uh, we still take care of our other branches, including the Coast Guard. So it's immaterial what branch you're in. If the need is there, we're there to provide the service. Tell us a little bit about your own service, though, because you are a, a veteran also. Well, uh, my time of service goes back to 1970 when I was 20 years old. And uh, I was down vacationing with a friend in Florida and Miami. And all of a sudden, my mom calls me and tells me, he says, there's an envelope in the, uh, in the house, and it has a token in it. And I says, well, I knew what that was. <laughs> was my draft notice. Uh, I went to the other branches and sure I had some college and they were willing to accept me as a warrant and fly helicopters. But I had a cousin who was a lieutenant in uh, Vietnam at Long Ben and um, he said, listen, you know, you fly choppers, your life expectancy is 90 days. So you may not want to do that. I said, okay, so let me see my choices. So I had <clears throat> enlisted, I, I had done paperwork with the Air Force. I was waiting for a uh, possible opening. And believe it or not, even though you volunteer for that service, they had a waiting list. Yep. So they said, well, more likely you'll be security police. But fortunately, an opening came up real quick. And uh, before I got drafted, I enlisted with the Air Force in, in accounting and finance. And so that was the beginning of embarking in 28 years of military service. Six active duty with the Air Force and the remainder with the Army National Guard of New York as a, a full-time AGR. Long career. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a splendid career. I mean, interesting. I mean, uh, he, 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 did a lot of traveling, found out that Army National Guard is not what it used to be. It's not a bunch of guys sitting around playing cards and having beer. Uh, we did a lot of missions, uh, very active. Uh, we uh, supported a lot of missions domestically with right. snowstorms or floods or hurricanes and, or even concerts or like Woodstock, which we supported that as well, too. Right. Um, and we had a lot of our missions where our New York Army National Guardsmen would spend a lot of time in foreign countries, either training or supporting reconstruction missions, like in Honduras, building schools and hospitals or in Thailand with our infantry training with their infantry or even Canada. So uh, we were, we've been actively involved. So it hasn't been, uh, it wasn't a dull. Did we go into Haiti also with the National Guard? The National Guard uh, supported the Tenth Mountain Division for their deployment, but did not go to Haiti. Oh, but we did. They did do searching of a members that would speak uh, Haitian, uh, because believe it or not, Tenth Mountain Division had no translators. Oh, 
So that those are the kind of missions and roles that the New York Army National Guard fulfills. Okay. So the the other thing I'd like to just bring up is we met a number of years ago mm -hmm. when you had an issue with a veteran here on Staten, a veteran's family here on Staten Island, and I mean this to me is just part of the types of support that are out there available for the Gold Star families. But as I remember that issue, it was that a family did not have a flag for their deceased veteran. And we were able to get together and actually go to that family's house and present them with the flag. Yes. The, uh, I don't remember the particulars of it, but to me that was an important thing to do. Yeah, yeah that, that was um, initially when um, I came on board with the program in 2010. Um, it was the Army contracted with all the various states to provide coverage for the National Guard. Right. And so there were approximately four of us in New York State at the time. I was working out of New York City. And so I had responsibilities for the five boroughs on Long Island. And we had a family here in Staten Island um, that had lost a uh, young man who was their son. He was in the National Guard. I uh, don't recall the circumstances. I think it was Something an illness. Something training, wasn't it? It was illness, I believe. And um, they had no idea what type of uh, support or services they were entitled to as the parents. Um, and so I met with Paul, and uh, we were able to identify those and those that we could fulfill through the Veterans Administration we took care of. New York Army National Guard provided burial details and everything. But what was missing was presenting the family with a flag, which they wanted, and that was a big honor to them above everything else that was offered. And so we were able to accomplish that with the help of uh, yep. his veterans group and the uh, New York Army National Guard and present them with a flag, which mm -hmm. was to them uh, very important. Very important. It, it was uh, very supportive, especially for the mom more than the father. So the I'm glad we were able to accomplish that. Um, uh, there have been cases where it's been difficult to get a flag sometimes. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. We had a similar case to that after that, after Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> and at that time we were not working together, but we had, we got word again through my veterans organization, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, that a veteran family here on Staten Island whose son had passed away, I believe it was while he was serving in Turkey mm -hmm. in the Air Force had died in an accident on the base. And they they had gotten a, a burial flag for him at that point, but Hurricane Sandy took that out to sea with their house. Wow. Yeah. And the way that it works with the VA, the way that the the regulation is written, you get a burial flag. Yes. A. So the VA was not willing to give them another one, even though it was lost basically by an act of God. Mm -hmm. And we worked with our congressman at the time to get back to the VA and say, you know, really, this is not, they didn't lose it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not something they misplaced. And through the VA and through the congressman's office, we were able to get another and we presented it. We had even gone to the point where saying, if not, we will buy the flag. This is an important thing for them. So we were able to present it at the It most certainly is. It symbolizes, you know, yep. everything that's out there, everything that veterans are about. I mean, yes. that that flag is something that we protected all our lives. Yeah. One way or another. And, you know, to, to take away that uh, yep. from the family is just wrong. You know? uh, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a difficult thing in, in, in those circumstances, even though the flag was eventually replaced, I think, it's more symbolic than anything else. It's something the family needed because actually the one they lost was the one that was probably on his coffin. Right. And, and that can't be replaced. Exactly. Um, but it's good to see that our representatives and working with the veterans and the VA were able to take care of it. You would have thought that the family could have taken care of it with the VA, but there's a lot of things the VA is trying to correct. It's going to take a lot longer time than I probably have, but... They've made some strides for getting there, but we have to keep up the pressure as veterans to make sure that they fulfill their mission to the veterans Absolutely. and their families. So it's similar to what I do with the uh, Gold Star families and um, work with veterans. Even though our program is 
really targeting the Gold Star families, and they have their issues with the VA as well because they're active sure. duty deaths. But you'd be surprised at the number of phone calls I receive um, with the eight counties that I represent from the directors of Veterans Affairs from each of those counties with regards to assistance for veterans. And, uh, you know, the lack of things that they, they need, whether it's uh, Military Order Purple Hearts or the County Veteran Services or the VFW American Legion, uh, we work with our counterparts at West Point to try and see that we can get these services for them or at least the contact. You know, the reality is we have the for good fortune of having two uh, representatives who work for the VA located at West Point. Mm -hmm. So I can actually walk to their office, sit down with them, they can go online and see what we can do to remediate the situation and help them. And uh, that, that brings a lot of comfort to the families okay. and the veteran. Now, are most of your cases all referrals from various well, the government functions? The cases that, uh, when it relates to supporting a Gold Star family, um, there's a whole uh, process that goes starting out with the notification of the family, the casualty assistance officer, yep. and, and I work with the casualty assistance officer, and I'll meet with that the family. That is a horrible, horrible job. Yep. So it, it's a situation where we review what that particular family might be entitled to. Everything is different depending on the circumstances. Um, parents are usually the ones that are less able to get benefits because if the soldier is married, yep. it's the family, family that he's married to that gets almost everything. Right. And, you know, the parents kind of feel like they're left out there. I mean, they are going to get symbolic things, um, but sometimes there are family dynamics that the family doesn't get it, the parents do. So there's a lot of things involved. Uh, my job is not to make that determination, but to make sure that whichever part of the family I'm working with, uh, first of all, the information they get is private. It's not available to the other family members. Right. And to ensure that not only do they get upfront what they need with the casualty officer, but when that casualty officer is finished with their service, that I continue long-term care and support with them, whether it's grief counseling, financial planning, or even uh, VA services they may be entitled to. And the other thing is also, uh, inviting them to events, keeping them in the network with other Gold Stars so that they can talk, bond, uh, create their own network that helps in their uh, resiliency and their recovery. So. What criteria is there to make a family designated a Gold Star family? That is a question, believe it or not, is asked repeatedly. And, and the simple answer is uh, a Gold Star family is a family that has lost a service member on active duty. And that's the key word, active, active duty. duty. Right. So if it's a reservist or a National Guardsman and it's a drill time um, and it's not on active service, then it, they're not a Gold Star family. They're survivors but and they may be entitled to some type of benefits, but they're not Gold Star families. Okay. Um, if it's a veteran that has retired and passes away, it's not a Gold Star. If it's a service member who ETS after just doing his original contracted time and passes away, unfortunately is not considered Gold Star. But that's not where the controversy ends. Um, there are two types of symbols for active duty passing for Gold Stars. So what is known as the original Gold Star pin is uh, the one that's worn with the purple inset. And that purple inset uh, signifies a killed in action. Right. So, and, and they were the original Gold Stars dating back to the end of World War I and carried on through World War II. Um, for other active duty deaths uh, related to an accident, illness, self-infliction. And this uh, is the majority of the cases. Yes. It would be two-thirds of the cases. Yes. Um, they also are entitled to uh, what looks like a Gold Star pin without the purple, and it's called the Next of Kin pin. Um, and they are honored as well as Gold Stars. Uh, however, the controversy arises that in the terminology, uh, even though the pins look similar except for the purple inset, uh, there are those that feel that the Gold Star is the one with the purple and the other one is Mexican, not really a Gold Star. And this has created a problem, uh, not just among the Gold Star families themselves, 
but also in uh, various states where they provide support Benefits. to Gold Star families. So if you're a killed in action Gold Star pin holder in New York State, there's a stipend that's available for the parents or the loved ones. But if you have the next of kin pin, you're not entitled to that stipend because it's not considered Gold Star. It's considered next of kin. So there's monetary dollars are involved. I would assume that's a legislative issue with New York. Yes, no, right. it's no. not a legislative issue with New York, or the states for that matter, uh, because it's they federal. go by the ruling of the federal government and what is contained in the legislation, and that is what they're driven by. Uh, they would love to assist the uh, other members who wear the next of kin pin, but unfortunately, uh, by legislation, which is designated federally, they cannot provide the funds for those individuals. So that's something that I've been trying to work with the military to try and uh, make a change, but um, that far as fall below other issues with the Gold Star families are trying to do right now. Paul, does the VFW have anything to do with any of the with the Gold Star interaction? We we do to some extent, but again, it's a secondary function to us as opposed to pri primarily we're mm -hmm. concerned about the, the, the veterans themselves. So once they've passed, yes, support for the family is important to right. us, but it's not our primary mission. It's a secondary mission to us. So uh, I, I can understand whether we'd have to have legislation basically changing the definition at the federal level, and then the states could mirror it. Uh, be interesting to if you send me information on it I can try to approach our local representative sure. or maybe he'd be interested in forwarding it because to me the person the veteran is dead mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter to the family whether he died in action or whether he died he's, he's dead not, he's dead and that's the reality of it and uh, to me that you know we'll see what we can do on that the other item I wanted to bring up, though, mm -hmm. is that uh, just last year, by executive order here in the state, we got the state of New York to recognize the Gold Star families in that they would be able to have their loved ones attend SUNY or CUNY free of charge. Yes. However, that. that was not legislative. That was executive decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't go into why I think that happened, but in any case... Uh, the issue with that is that that comes to an end in the spring of this year, hmm. unless the governor again puts it in place, or unless the legislation that's been placed on hold by his executive decision comes back into the fray. And we are very hmm. much interested in both of those cases. We're hoping that when the governor proposes his budget in the next month, that it is included in there because I'm sorry, but it's totally unfair to exclude gold star families when you are allowing people that are here illegally in the country to go to the same college. I was just break. going to say the same thing, and, which is obviously the reason that the, the governor placed that executive order in. Yeah. In any case, that's, that is our position as the VFW that those parents should be recognized, and their families should be recognized for they, what they've given. Yeah, I, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of education that needs to take place. I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to uh, network with various organizations, veterans agencies, and mm -hmm. foundations to identify what is a Gold Star, because we've had, I've had Gold Star family members that are still in the military, that they were both members were in the military and they lost one and come up to me and say, I walked down the hall at the Pentagon and I wore my gold star pin on Nobody my class A uniform and I had another officer walk up to me and ask me why I was out of uniform wearing that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's a gold star pin. And the officer turned around and said, well, how do I get one of those? And says, you don't want to get one of those. Oh. Yeah. And, and here's a full feel great officer at the Pentagon not knowing what the symbol represents to another officer who has lost a loved one wearing that. And that scares me when it's one thing educating the public, but when the military doesn't get it, where do we start? And so 
that's one of the, the hurdles that we have to try and overcome to understand that with the amount of conflicts that we're in worldwide and the amount of service members we're losing. Um, just yesterday I found out that we lost a Black Hawk in Minnesota and we yep. lost three members on that Black Hawk who were killed. So that's active duty because they were flying it on active duty doing maintenance. So now we have three families before the holidays that lost loved ones. So, you know, I know Minnesota will do what they have to. In New York State, we have seven individuals, including myself, that provide support to our Gold Star families throughout the state. And we have one located right here at uh, Fort Hamilton. I'm at West Point. We have another in Camp Smith, another in Albany, Syracuse, and in Buffalo. And so they're there to provide uh, coverage for our Gold Star families. But it's through all 50 states, our program, and territories. So even as far away as Guam and Samoa and Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, we have representatives to help our Gold Star families. Now, you used the phrase public just now. Mm -hmm. What can the public do to assist you in your job? Is there anything that they can do? Well, I would say to all veterans that are watching this show, um, you will probably know at some point another veteran that needs assistance and you're not quite sure. Feel free to contact any of our uh, representatives at the locations I mentioned, even at Fort Drum or West Point, Camp Smith, Fort Hamilton, and we can help you through the process if it's an active duty death. If it's a veteran that's passed away, we can also assist. We might be able to direct you to Army Emergency Relief if that's what you need. Uh, there are VA representatives of most of these installations that will tell them about any VA benefits they may be eligible for. And if they're a reservist or National Guard member, well, we can refer me to Latham, New York, with headquarters for the Guard, or Fort Totten with the reserves, where they can avail themselves of the resources to help the loved ones. Very good. Yeah. Now, do you have a contact number that uh, we'll, we'll post your contact mm -hmm. numbers sure. at the end of the show with the closing? Yeah. But uh, do you have a contact number? If, if they need to reach out to me uh, at West Point, they could reach out to me at area code 845 nine three eight five six five four and that's the direct line in my office and i'm there generally every day monday through friday from eight to five you know unfortunately you could do the cutbacks we don't work weekends anymore yeah. so but uh we're there to support and and if you're not close to the west point area i can direct you to the name and the contact of a person who's close to where you are very good yeah Thank so you. we can provide the service yeah. paul i wanted to defer a little bit to you uh Bring us up to date on the uh, the Blue Water uh, Navy bill. Sure. Well, Blue Water Navy bill, this is at the federal level, was passed so that those service members who were serving on ships off the coast, and there's a mileage limitation, so this is mm. going to get complicated, but <laughs> <laughs> anything that you do with lawyers involved gets complicated. But in any case, it is complicated. But there's a whole nother group of veterans from the Vietnam era that are now eligible for uh, both compensation and for treatment for Agent Orange exposure. And it's those that were on the, uh, the another set of ships that were off the coast of Vietnam. And President Trump signed that into President the... Trump did sign that earlier this year. Okay. Uh, we've been told that the VA plans to start implementing this in January timeframe. So if you believe that you are one of the veterans that fall into this area, that you were, particularly if you were previously denied benefits, it is very critical for you to go and place your claim now. My suggestion to you would be, go to the VFW, go to the American Legion, one of the organizations that provides free assistance in filing your claim. Get your claim on file. Your claim, if it gets approved finally, goes back to the day that you applied, not to the day it's approved. So if you wait, you're losing all of the benefits that you would have. And again, there are free services at both the VFW and the American Legion, the disabled veterans, all of these organizations have free assistance. It's kind of like doing a complicated tax program. Mm -hmm. It's much better to have somebody that knows what they're doing. When I went for my hearing loss claim, I went to a service officer, got this taken care of. Uh, the second item that we have is that uh, 
for those of us that uh, got injured while we were serving, the VA provides us with compensation for our injury. For those of us that also retired from the service, the way the law is written right now is that they subtract up to 40% of our disability from our retirement. That's correct. And we're working on trying to get the Congress to overturn that, but right now that's not in play. Uh, to be perfectly honest, you got hurt while you were serving, so basically they're taxing you for, <laughs> for right. getting exactly. hurt. Yeah. Yep. But to me, the more serious part is that, uh, I'll use my own case, my wife loses compensation should I die. That's right. Because I've lost my hearing. Doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> no. In other words, the, the pension payment to her would be reduced by the amount of my disability for the rest of her life because I got hurt while I was serving. And right now, the, the way that this stands is that both, ho both houses, the Senate and the, Rep and the uh, Assembly nationally, have bills ready to go that would eliminate this, what's called the widow's tax, basically. Uh, the other option, which would be easier, is that the National Defense Authorization Act, which was supposed to be passed in September, mm -hmm. Bitch, which instead was kicked down the road by a continuing resolution yep. once and is right now looking to be kicked down the road Still again. January. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the NDAA, but not in the continuing resolution. So if the NDAA ever gets passed, that's the National Defense Authorization Act, it would call for the elimination of the widow's tax and it would be funded that way. So there's two routes. Uh, the best thing I can tell you is call your representatives, call your senators, and say, pass the National Defense Authorization Act. I mean, realistically, it's causing all kinds of problems with the military because you don't know what funding you have coming in the future. Sure. So you, don't, you, you can't do any long-range planning at all. But, this, but if you pass the NDAA now instead of a continuing resolution, you would be getting the elimination of the widow's tax done. Well, thank I think, you very much. I think one of the things that a lot of our veterans don't realize is that, as you were mentioning about the reduction of your military pension, yeah. uh, to begin with, a spouse that would be eligible for a portion of his is going to be 55% of whatever right. the service member is receiving of that pension. So if now you, it's reduced, what he gets, that 55% comes even down less. to less than grocery payments. Well, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for all of the input and everything you've done for us. Uh, Raul, thank you for coming down from Pleasure. West Point. Thank you so Paul, much. as always, thank you. Same thing, Paul. Uh, thank you for watching in honor of. God bless you.